This is it. This is it. Whoa! <laughs> what the? Oh! The Scarlet. Scarlet. Oh, that shit is beautiful! <laughs> A new console launch is always an exciting time for gamers. Many of us will no doubt soon be bidding a fond farewell to our last-gen machines. But looking back at the end of each passing console generation, there's usually that one final game. A game that comes out near the end of a system's lifespan and helps to gracefully usher it into the past. These final games are usually some of the best examples of what a console has to offer, with developers having had the time and know-how to truly push consoles to their absolute limits. From the NES to the PlayStation 4, this is a look back at all of those swan song console games of the past. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm Travis and welcome to Game Rats. Before we get started, I kind of just wanted to explain a little bit about how I'm selecting each swan song game in this video. First of all, every game is going to be a console exclusive that released in North America, at least for the time. And second, not every game is going to be a dictionary definition of a swan song. Instead, I'm going to select games that came out kind of closer to when a successor console was released. So. With that out of the way, we're going to start with a little bit about each console followed by its swan song. Starting off with the major systems first, with a lot of the weirder, lesser known consoles towards the end of the video. But for now, let's kick it off with the almighty NES. It may be the most addictive toy in history, and it's definitely the hottest thing this Christmas. Nintendo Video Games. When the Nintendo Entertainment System was released in October 1985, people were completely over video games. At the time, games were thought to have been nothing more than a passing fad that had come and gone. It was really the, the demise of the business, and, and we unfortunately didn't see it coming. Until an elusive newcomer, Nintendo, came along to try to release their Famicom in the Western market. After Atari, ColecoVision, and many other hardware manufacturers of the late 70s and early 80s had straight up run the video game industry into the ground with an oversaturated market filled with poor quality games and less than stellar arcade ports. Nintendo, Mario, Rob the Robot, and a little seal of quality came along to pick up the pieces. Nintendo single-handedly revived the video game industry with the NES, and for good reason. The console had better graphics and gameplay than anyone had ever seen at the time. Instead of the many high-score-chasing arcade-style titles of the Atari age, the NES had games with more depth and substance for players to get lost in. Learning from the mistakes of Atari's past, Nintendo took quality assurance very seriously. Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy, Metroid, Castlevania, the list of iconic video game franchises that were born on the NES goes on and on. Starting in October 1985 with Super Mario Bros., to its last official release with Wario's Woods in December of 94. With a library of so many essential games, which one is the NES swan song? Song. It's gotta be Super Mario Bros. 3. Leading up to Mario 3's release date, the hype was off the charts. The movie The Wizard had just come out in theaters, and it basically served as an hour and 40 minute commercial for Mario 3. Super Mario Bros. 3! Released just six months before the SNES, Mario 3 served as the first true sequel to the original Mario Brothers. If you were unaware, Mario 2 is actually a remade version of the Japan-only Famicom Disk System game, Doki Doki Panic. Mario's third outing did away with the throwing mechanic from Mario 2, and instead had gameplay more reminiscent of the first Mario. Tighter controls, better graphics, and a new flying tanuki suit. And for the first time, a world map for Mario to use for traversal from level to level. It still stands as one of the greatest games of all time. And it happened to be the best-selling game on the NES, besides the pack-in title. Mario 3 saw Nintendo into the next generation, with the SNES. But before that, a new competitor entered the ring, Sega. After Nintendo had proven that video games could still have a viable market in North America, another Japanese company followed suit. Repackaging the struggling Mark III, the Sega Master System arrived on Western shores in September 1986. It wasn't exactly the smash hit that Sega would have hoped for, at least in most of the world. 
Maybe it was the system's bland game box art, Sega's small marketing budget, or its lack of any must-have games on par with Mario. The Master System was just never able to resonate the same way that the NES did in North America, even though it was a more powerful machine. Back in 1986, Nintendo had a 90% grasp over the North American video game market. Sega, and to some extent, Atari, were left to pick through the scraps with the remaining 10%. Sega's process Prospects didn't much improve throughout the system's lifespan. They were barely able to make a dent in Nintendo's success. Despite its poor sales, the Master System wasn't a bad console by any stretch. Master System owners got some great games like Alex Kidd and Miracle World, Fantasy Star, and Hang On. The console's final game to officially come out was a port of Sonic the Hedgehog in 1991. But the Master System's swan song is Wonder Boy 3, The Dragon's Trap. Released in 1989, the same year as Sega's new console, Wonder Boy 3 is just awesome. It's an outstanding blend of platforming, non-linear exploration, and it even has some RPG mechanics. The Dragon's Trap begins with Wonder Boy being cursed and turned into Lizard Man. As you adventure on through the game's many different locales, you'll be cursed again and again, each time turning into a different monster that has its own unique combat and traversal abilities. It plays sort of like a side-scrolling Legend of Zelda, with new curses allowing access to areas that were previously inaccessible, like Mouse Man, who can run on walls or ceilings, or Piranha Man, who is the only monster that can swim. The game is as good today as it was back in 1989. You may have even seen it recently, since it was remade on current consoles and PC in 2017. Wonder Boy saw a fledgling Sega pass the torch into the 16-bit generation. Only this time, they were truly ready to take on Nintendo. Ah, <sighs> the Sega Genesis. Christmas morning, a copy of Aladdin and Sonic the Hedgehog. The Genesis was the very first console that I was lucky enough to call my own. As a kid, I definitely fell victim to all of the Sega does what Nintendo don't marketing. And hey, maybe it didn't have quite as many colors as the Super Nintendo, but to me, none of that mattered. I loved it all the same. As you know, the Master System did little to help Sega dethrone Nintendo from the top spot, but the Genesis, or Mega Drive outside of America, that's a different story. Even with it being the first 16-bit console to release in North America, Sega still had an uphill battle ahead of them. At the time, the Big N was so massive that it was kind of unusual to even hear people use the term video game. Instead, it was simply called Nintendo. This year, Nintendo may be up against some serious competition. Sega changed all of that. With the help of Sonic the Hedgehog and some aggressive marketing, they were able to finally give Nintendo a run for their money, even becoming the number one console in North America, if only for a brief period. Sega put up one hell of a fight with some really great games. Of course, Sonic the Hedgehog, but also Castlevania Bloodlines, Fantasy Star, Streets of Rage, Golden Axe, and a library of Sega's vastly superior sports games. The list goes on, but when you boil it down to one defining final Genesis game, it has to be Sonic the Hedgehog 3 with Sonic and Knuckles, which when combined with Sega's lock-on technology, gave players the full Sonic 3 package. On their own, it's basically Sonic 3 and Sonic 3.5. Released in 1994, roughly six months apart and shortly before the train wreck release of the Sega Saturn, Sonic 3 and Knuckles isn't given the same love and affection from Sega as Sonic 1 and 2. They have a habit of leaving it out of many of their modern compilations. But over the years, many have come to realize just how great it is. Even though it came out during a time when people were getting a bit sick of seeing Sonic, oh no! it really shows the peak of what the Genesis was capable of. Beautiful graphics, more vibrant colors than anything I've seen before in the Genesis, and a pretty solid soundtrack that was kinda partially composed by Michael Jackson, but also kinda not. The game feels more cohesive than previous titles. Its stages feel less like run-of-the-mill levels, but more like Sonic is actually progressing through some complete world. He's always seen transitioning from level to level in a seamless way, snowboarding in from the zone before, or flying in on an airplane, making it feel like all of the levels are interconnected. Sonic 3 even had a save feature for the first time in the series. As a kid, this really confused me. Since I was so used to starting games from the beginning every time I wanted to play 
play them. It took a while for me to realize that I could just pick up from where I left off. Sega really went all out here, and while it certainly isn't the last great game released on the Genesis, it is the one that reminded owners why they had spent so much time with their blast processing consoles all along. The next piece of the 16-bit trifecta came from Hudson Soft and NEC, the TurboGrafx-16. While Sega and Nintendo were busy duking it out for the top spot, the TurboGrafx was basically just fighting to exist. In Japan, it was known as the PC engine, and it was very successful. But stateside, it never saw sales even remotely close to that of the Genesis or the SNES. But that doesn't mean that it was a bad system. It just had a lot working against it. Having primarily worked with home PCs in the past, NEC was a bit unfamiliar with the video game market, resulting in the TurboGrafx being advertised poorly. And on top of that, the TurboGrafx-16 wasn't even technically a 16-bit console. Even though it has the number proudly displayed in its name, it only has an 8-bit CPU. It was essentially a slightly more powerful NES, but compared to a Sega Genesis or later a Super Nintendo, it didn't stand a chance. The system and its adorable little hue cards made managed to sell less than 1 million units in its North American run. Sales so poor that the console's European release was canceled. Today, the TurboGrafx is a highly collectible system. It's mostly known for its library of excellent shoot-em-ups, but in addition, there are games like Splatterhouse, Legendary Axe, and Newtopia to round out the system's catalog. With no new console to succeed the TurboGrafx in the West, its swan song and one of its final games ever is Bonk 3, Bonk's Big Adventure. If you're unfamiliar with Bonk, he's a little caveman, or cave boy, with a big appetite for meat and a head as hard as diamonds, apparently. In an age when every video game console needed a mascot, Bonk took the reins as the TurboGrafx equivalent to Mario or Sonic. Bonk's Big Adventure is probably my personal favorite of the series. It has the same unique art style and gameplay of the first two games, except this time around, it adds a really fun two-player co-op mode and new candies that both, um, Bonks can eat to become tiny or giant, allowing access to new areas or to just let you do a mega bonk slam onto enemies. If you've never tried a Bonk game before, they are all worth checking out today, with Bonk 3 being no exception. There's just something about these games that gives them this whimsical kind of vibe. I can't really put my finger on it, but they have a much more relaxed and adventurous tone to them when compared to something like Mario or Sonic. The TurboGrafx ended up being the last system that NEC released in North America. And as for Bonk, he hasn't had a new game in years, but he did later get Super Bonk released on the Super Nintendo. Hang on there, big boy. I'm the Super Nintendo guy. I think I'll be taking it from here. All right. Now you're playing with power, super power. Released in September 1991, the Super Nintendo took the foundation the NES had set in place and catapulted it into the next level. The SNES had better graphics, a new controller with more buttons, and a less bland design than the original Nintendo. Being the final system released in the fourth console generation, the SNES was the most powerful of the bunch. Sega did have a slight edge on the Super Nintendo in the speed department, which is where they got their fabled blast processing from, but the SNES blew the Sega away in every other technical category. The SNES is still an all-time favorite console to many, and it deserves all the praise that it gets. So many great games released on the system. Zelda, Yoshi's Island, Final Fantasy, hell, even Paul Rudd was in on the action. The last game to come out from Nintendo for the SNES was Kirby's Dream Land 3 in 1997, though the Super Nintendo's swan song came out around the same time as the Nintendo 64 in the holiday season of 1996. Super Donkey Kong 3, Donkey Kong Country 3, while still under fire from Sega's edgy marketing claiming that the SNES was an underpowered console for children, Nintendo doubled down. Nintendo says, yeah, we don't care what you think, Sega, you're gonna play as babies. Now look at these babies. This guy is named Kitty Kong, and he 
is a baby. This might get me banned from Super Nintendo World, but I wasn't a fan of these babies. As the youngest child with two siblings, I would get angry as more often than not, I was Kitty Kong being thrown to my death by my older sibling. I was already the lowest power level in my real life. Why would I want to be the same thing in a video game? Just like the last two DK games, only when the player in control hits select or dies does the other player take over. Pretty crappy if you ask me, but that's the only option we had. The bottom line was, no matter how many ripped gator men you emasculated by jumping on their heads, you were still a baby. These events would later go on to negatively affect my views on monkeys and other various primates. <laughs> Going back to the game now, it's a little more enjoyable. It's very apparent that Rare was trying to use every bit of power that the Super Nintendo had when they crafted Donkey Kong 3. Now, they might take my Super Power Club card, but I prefer the pixel style of games like Yoshi's Island and Kirby's Dream Land over the 3D compressed style of Donkey Kong. With that being said, not many 16-bit games look like Donkey Kong. DK3 had the most fleshed out world of the series. The game drops a fat 48 levels across 8 worlds on your head, so there's plenty of content to monkey around with. Boy, I'm sure gonna lose a lot of sleep over that joke. There are bosses in DK3, just like before. Boss fights work more like puzzles rather than actual showdowns, where you simply wait and dodge attacks. Personally, I prefer more skill-based boss battles where there are multiple approaches to winning, rather than figuring out a two-dimensional puzzle that has only one solution. All in all, I'd say from my experience, unless you're real curious to try this one for yourself, just skip it. Stick with DK1 and DK2. <laughs> Well, that really concludes it for the Super Nintendo. Pretty definitive. Yeah. You done? I mean, yeah, I think so. You done? Yeah, I'm done. Get off me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I broke character. <laughs> <laughs> so that does it for the 16-bit generation. Thank you, Tom, for stopping by. Uh, up next is the 32-bit generation, starting off with the Sega Saturn. Setting all of Sega's add-on consoles aside, the Sega Saturn was the true successor to the Genesis. Surprise release during E3 in May of 1995, Sega's $399 machine beat Sony and Nintendo to market, making Sega the first of the major players to make the jump into the fifth console generation. I don't know, I just woke up from a little nap, it's a little dark, but... You guys silly? I'm still gonna send it. <laughs> and send it they did. Sega sent the Saturn to market on crutches. The system's sudden E3 launch wasn't only a surprise to those in attendance of the conference, but a shock to retailers and game developers as well. Sega was unable to manufacture enough units to fill retailer orders, and in the process of the rush launch, they ended up permanently burning some bridges. Retailers such as KB Toys refused to ever stock Sega products again. The Saturn launched with just four games, with the rest arriving closer to its original originally planned September 1995 release date. The Saturn did end up performing pretty well in Japan, but in the rest of the world, it was stuck in dead last. The console ended up being one of Sega's biggest blunders. However, there's still a lot to love about the system. During its North American run that lasted just over three years, some excellent games were released. Even without it having a mainline Sonic game, the Saturn was home to Virtual Fighter, Panzer Dragoon, Die Hard Arcade, Nights into Dreams, and so many more. As for the system's swan song, I specifically remember seeing an advertisement in an old Electronic Gaming Monthly or GamePro or something. No, 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 not that one. In the ad, there were three games shown. However, for the life of me, I just can't find it. The ad was for Panzer Dragoon Saga, The House of the Dead, and Burning Rangers. I'm going to bend my own rule here and pick more than one game because these three games were all released within a month of each other in March, April, and May of 1998. Each one in their own right is an example of the Saturn performing at its absolute best in multiple ways. Panzer Dragoon Saga showed that the Saturn was capable of a massive AAA RPG, something that could rival even Final Fantasy. Saga is an excellent game. It features a massive world to explore and a very unique battle system. The House of the Dead is a good example of what Sega originally marketed the Saturn as, the full arcade experience at home. It does have some long load times and a pretty severe graphical downgrade compared to the arcade version, but for the most part, the House of the Dead is the arcade experience on the Saturn. 
And finally, Burning Rangers, the second Saturn game from Sonic Team. Burning Rangers is this weird anime-inspired sci-fi firefighter simulator. That's probably the best way I can sum it up. It's an action platformer that probably stands out as the single best example of the Saturn's ability to run a game in 3D. It's certainly nowhere near what the PlayStation and the N64 could pull off, but for the Saturn, it's pretty impressive. And had there been some other alternate reality where the Saturn was king, these three games show the potential of what more late-release Saturn games could have looked like. Saturn Shenmue, anyone? The Saturn may have been doomed from the start, but for what it's worth, at least Sega made right almost every single wrong with their next console, the Dreamcast. We'll touch more on that one later. But for now, let's move on to another system that you might have heard of. The 16-bit era primarily focused on two major players, Sega and Nintendo. Yet, with the fourth generation soon coming to an end and the 3D revolution just on the horizon, a newcomer to the video game industry, Sony, felt that there was room for one more player. 299. And they were very, very right. Before the PlayStation, Sony tried to partner with both Sega and Nintendo on a joint venture into the console business, to no avail. A decision that I'm sure still haunts Sega and Nintendo to this day. Sony was shot down, so Ken Kutaragi and Sony said screw it and went to market on their own. Thanks to an affordable price, state-of-the-art 3D capabilities, and a slew of incredible games, the Sony PlayStation would end up becoming the undisputed champion of the fifth console generation selling just over 100 million units in its 11-year lifespan. Back in 95, I remember asking for a Sega Saturn for Christmas. But instead, I got a PlayStation. I think Santa did me a favor that year. From the get-go, I was enamored with my new PS1. From early games like Twisted Metal, Destruction Derby, and Doom, to later Tomb Raider, Resident Evil, Metal Gear Solid, and even my first RPG, Final Fantasy VII. I don't think I figured out that you could change your equipment until at least 10 hours in. The final game released on Sony's first foray into video games was a sports title, FIFA 2005. However, its true swan song came out just a few weeks after the PS2 launched and nearly coincided with the competition in Nintendo's Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. And that game is Final Fantasy IX, released in November of 2000. FF9 was a bit of a return to form for the Final Fantasy series, taking place in a high fantasy medieval setting filled with knights, mages, and chocobos for the first time since the original titles. Final Fantasy IX stars the young bandit Zidane. With his long flowing tail and his witty sense of humor, Zidane is tasked with kidnapping Princess Garnett in the midst of a war between two nations. The princess and many other extremely likable and weird characters join him on a quest to take down Queen Braun and end the war in the process. It's got everything that the Final Fantasy series is known for. Epic story, towns and worlds to explore, and turn-based combat. Unlike some Final Fantasy games, Final Fantasy IX doesn't take itself too seriously, and it helps it to stand out from the rest. Humor is key in the game's story. From the fumbling awkwardness of Vivi to Quinna's quest for fine cuisine and frogs, the game is just beaming with personality, which is why Final Fantasy IX is still regarded as one of the best games in the series. A fitting swan song for the PS1, a system that owes so much of its success to Squaresoft and Final Fantasy VII, which no doubt had a major influence on the console's sales early in its lifespan. You know who everybody's after. You know the games of Nintendo 64. The Nintendo 64 was Nintendo's third console. Coming out just over a year after the PlayStation in September of 98, the 64 was the most powerful 3D machine of the time. Nintendo churned out games that the competition could only dream of running. The way I remember it, and I'm pretty sure many others feel the same way, playing the N64 for the first time was mind-blowing. It was probably the only time in my life that a new console felt truly next-gen. Going from something like Super Mario World on the SNES to Mario 64 was just insane. Fully realized 3D worlds were no longer some 90s fever dream. They were actually here. Mario could go anywhere in the Mushroom Kingdom, climb any tree, or jump over any gap. At the time, it was amazing. 
Even though the N64 makes a great first impression, it was a bit of a troubled console. In the fifth console generation, almost every hardware manufacturer opted to move on from cartridges and instead built their machines around CD technology. Except for two, the N64 and the Atari Jaguar. Not exactly the best company for Nintendo to be in. Nintendo's decision to stick with carts may have eliminated load times, but it also kept production costs high. In addition, the cartridges restricted game sizes to a maximum of 64 megabytes, with competing CD-based consoles able to cram 650 megabytes into a single disc for a much lower cost. Because of the limitations that the N64's cartridges presented, many third-party developers jumped ship from Nintendo to PlayStation. Probably most notably, Squaresoft shifting Final Fantasy VII over to Sony, and not to mention the countless other third-party games that never appeared on the N64. Throughout its lifespan that was just shy of four years, beginning with Mario in September 98 and ending with a stripped-down version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 in August of 2002, the 64 was home to many celebrated games. Both of its Zelda titles, the first Super Smash Bros., GoldenEye, Perfect Dark, Mario Kart 64, Banjo-Kazooie, and last but not least, a foul-mouthed drunken squirrel in Conker's Bad Fur Day. Developed by Rare at the height of the studio's peak, Conker was one of the final games released for the 64 in March of 2001. To this day, I still can't believe this game actually exists. Yet, here we are. At first glance, Conker is a cutesy-looking 3D platformer. But don't be fooled because it's wrapped in a blood-soaked, vulgar, and hilarious package. And it happens to be one of the most technically impressive games on the Nintendo 64. And even crazier, it somehow has fully voiced dialogue, all crammed into one 64-megabyte cartridge. I am the great mighty fool. Conker's Bad Fur Day follows the titled squirrel's journey home to his girlfriend, Barry after a drunken night out on the town. Along the way, he meets a cast of eccentric characters, gets up to plenty of ridiculous antics, and even finds himself in a few dated movie parodies. Believe it or not, Conker wasn't always this obscene. Bad Fur Day actually began development as Conker's 12 Tales, which would have been a standard, wholesome platformer, more in line with Rare's previous titles. Until one day they said, forget all that, and they just flipped it upside down and made, essentially, a parody of the genre that they themselves had near perfected. Oh, and for the sake of everyone's eyes, I'm going to switch over to the Xbox One version real quick. There, that's that's better. Unlike a game like, say, Banjo-Kazooie, Conker follows a more linear progression. It's more of a story-driven action platformer than an open-ended collectathon. As ironic as it is to Nintendo's family-friendly image, Conker stands as the N64's swan song. It still holds up today, unlike many N64 games. Looking back, the N64 was really kinda Nintendo's first failure, and it certainly isn't its last. Don't get me wrong, I love the system as a kid. But with the exception of its handful of major titles, which are excellent, everything else is just kinda not worth revisiting. Hopefully I'm not upsetting the N64 crowd too much here. It's just for me, the system's blurry graphics and its weird controller just haven't aged as well as some of the other retro systems out there. And with that, that wraps up the major consoles, at least for this video. But stick around because there were plenty of weird, lesser known consoles and add ons that released in the early 90s. Some of them were pretty good, others are just very, very bad. So here's the rest of them, just in a bit of a faster fashion. Ugh, why'd you do that? I just saved you from Ganon! You did not. Above all else, the Philips CDI is probably best known for its ridiculous Zelda and Mario games. We're talking some of the worst of the worst in gaming history here. However, the CDI was a bit more than just a home to, uh, whatever this is. This will make a great omelet! Here! Thanks. Philips originally intended the CDI to be used for training programs and edutainment reference experiences. But as you know, the CDI became best known for its games. From its release in 1991 at the very reasonable price of 1,000 US dollars, Oh! No! 
to its demise when Philips stopped supporting it in early 1998, the CDI has one of the strangest libraries of any console out there. It's probably the only time you could see Zelda, Compton's Interactive Encyclopedia, and Playboy's Complete Massage release alongside each other. The final game published by Philips and the CDI's swan song was an FMV rail shooter called The Lost Ride. There's not a whole lot of info out there about this game, but what I did find comes from YouTube channel Half Blind Gamer, where he does a deep dive on the game. It appears to be technically impressive for the CDI. It utilizes procedural generation and FMV to mix up the levels every time you play them. That's probably the first and only time that's ever happened. However, being technically impressive alone doesn't necessarily make for a good game. It feels unfinished, with many inconsistencies. The first of the CD add-ons to come to market, NEC's TurboGrafx CD gave TurboGrafx owners the chance to finally throw out their old cassette tapes and listen to some newfangled audio CDs. Get rocked by mind-blowing CD stereo sound. Oh, and it did have plenty of games too. The system was a much bigger success in Japan than it ever was in North America, with region-exclusive games like Castlevania Rondo of Blood or Dracula X, whatever you want to call it, and Hideo Kojima's Snatcher making appearances on the PC Engine CD only in Japan. Eventually, NEC even packed the CD add-on into an all-in-one package with the Turbo Duo. Unfortunately, the CD add-on or the duo weren't enough to reignite interest in the Turbo Graphics in the Western market, or let it garner the same support that it received in Japan. But it did still receive plenty of quality games. Some Turbo CD games were enhanced ports of their Hue card counterparts, like Bonk 3 here. But as far as CD-only games go, there was Yeez 4, Valis, and the incredibly rare Cotton Fantastic Night Dreams. The system's final release in North America and its swan song was the point-and-click adventure game Beyond Shadowgate in December 1993. Released exclusively in North America, Beyond Shadowgate is a sequel to the 1988 Mac game, Shadowgate. With a slow pace and a moody atmosphere, it featured fully voiced dialogue, a CD quality soundtrack, and branching paths. Reviews of the game were mostly positive, with Electronic Gaming Monthly giving the game 7.5 out of 10. Guess what? I'm big enough to ride that pack beast right there if I want to. I'm sure you can, and I bet you're a good rider too. Yes. The Neo Geo Advanced Entertainment System. So damn expensive that not even the rich kid's parents got him one. Originating as the Neo Geo MVS in arcades, which is basically a cartridge-based unit that allowed arcade owners to swap out games without having to buy an entirely new cabinet. The AES is essentially SNK's home console version of the MVS. God, that's a lot of acronyms. Launching in 1993 at $650 for the console and $200 plus for each game, the system was kind of like the Lamborghini of the home console market. It truly did bring the arcade experience home, but its steep price kept it from ever seeing mainstream success. The system featured arcade-perfect versions of games such as Metal Slug, Fatal Fury, and The King of Fighters. Its final game came out a whopping 14 years after the initial launch of the AES in 2004, Samurai Showdown 5 Special. Now that's some dedicated console support. I confess, I'm not much of a fan of fighting games, but I do know that Samurai Showdown is a series that the fighting game community goes nuts over. It's a tweaked version of the original Samurai Showdown 5. It features some gameplay balancing and the return of fatality-like finishers from Samurai Showdown 4. The game is currently available for the PlayStation 4 if you want to check it out for yourself. A few years after the AES came out, SNK released another console, the Neo Geo CD in 1996. The system is basically identical to the AES when it comes to games, only it wasn't quite as pricey. The CD games had a more affordable asking price of around $50 to $80. The final Neo Geo CD game released and its swan song was another fighting classic, The King of Fighters 99, Millennium Battle, released in 1999. <laughs> The Sega CD was the first of Sega's Genesis add-ons, and it was the most successful one of the bunch, but that's still not saying much. Hey! 
You still don't have a Sega CD? Marketed with the same Genesis does what Nintendo attitude with its Welcome to the Next Level ad campaign, the Sega CD promised games so intense that it would literally blow you away. Except what it really had to offer was a whole lot of this. With some exceptions aside like Sonic CD, Shining Force, and Snatcher, the Sega CD had a vast library of mediocre FMV games and Genesis ports. Ports that did usually add some new content, like Cliffhanger here, but ports nonetheless. Official support for the Sega CD lasted from its release date in November 1993 to September 1995. About seven months after the Saturn had come out, the system's final two games were released, Wild Woody and Lunar Eternal. Eternal Blue. I'm not entirely sure which one actually came out last, but let's go with Lunar, because Wild Woody is, um, special. Wild Woody! Coming from working designs, Lunar Eternal Blue is a direct sequel to the earlier Sega CD Lunar game, Lunar the Silver Star. This JRPG serves as a perfect example of just what the Sega CD needed more of. Games. Games with actual substance to them instead of FMV experiences. Lunar Eternal Blue presented a rich story, deep character progression, and GamePro even called it the best Sega CD game of 1995. Remember when I said there were multiple add-ons? Well, here's the next one. Oh, the infamous 32X. A cancerous tumor that attached to the top of your Sega Genesis. The console expanded the Genesis bit count to 32, and it allowed you to play new 32X cartridges. Or if you were feeling extra crazy, there was even a handful of 32X Sega CD games, which required three systems to play, the Genesis, Sega CD, and the 32X. The 32X definitely gets a bad rap, and rightfully so, but I do have a soft spot for it, kind of due to just how how weird it is. The system was originally intended to be a stopgap between the Genesis and the Saturn. It was something to hold people over until the true next gen arrived. But with the two systems coming out within six months of each other, it left people wondering why they would even need a 32X in the first place, which resulted in poor sales. In addition, support for the add-on was minimal at best, with the North American library having just 36 games. It may not have many great games, but there are some here and there. It has some near arcade perfect ports like Virtual Fighter, Space Harrier, and Mortal Kombat 2, as well as some other interesting exclusive games like Knuckles Chaotix and Calibri. And well, that's basically it. The final 32X game was a little number called Spider-Man Web of Fire, a game that I've personally been looking for since I was like 12 years old out of sheer curiosity, but I've never even seen it in person outside of conventions. Coming out exclusively in North America, Spider-Man Web of Fire really isn't anything special. In fact, it's kinda bad. It's a run-of-the-mill side-scrolling beat-em-up that doesn't really show anything that the 32X was capable of. I mean, the Genesis Spider-Man games look and play much better than this. Yet, with it being a late 32X release, it had a low print run, and thus, it's incredibly rare and valuable today. At the end of the day, it's a game that probably could have run on the Genesis just fine, making you wonder why you would ever need a 32X in the first place. A fitting end to an unnecessary system, if you ask me. What if, instead of shelling out the cash to build a console on your own, you could license out the technology to another company that would build it for you and pay you royalties? Well, that's exactly what former Electronic Arts CEO Trip Hawkins did with the 3DO. It was a console that came in multiple shapes and sizes, coming from companies like Panasonic, Gold Star, and Sanyo. The 3DO was an interesting, if not unsuccessful, experiment. Leading up to the launch, the system had a good bit of hype. It looked technically impressive for the time and promised the next generation of interactive entertainment. Hell, the 3DO was even named Time Magazine's Product of the Year in 1993. The only problem? It was kinda terrible. And it cost $700 at launch, which translates to roughly $1,200 if you adjust for inflation. And people thought the PS3 was pricey. PlayStation 3 will retail for $599 US dollars. God, launching with just one game, the appropriately titled Combat Racer, Crash and Burn, things were rocky for the 3DO from the start, and they didn't improve. It did have a few good games like Return Fire, Gex, Road Rash, and a masterpiece 
from the critically acclaimed Naughty Dog Studios, Way of the Warrior. Yeah, this game sucks. With the handful of good games aside, much like the Sega CD, the 3DO had a library that was mostly full of terrible FMV games. Personally, I think these games are kinda hilarious, but they are in actuality very, very bad. Then and now. After selling around 2 million units, the 3DO was eventually discontinued in 1997, and joining it on its fade into obscurity was its swan song, Captain Quasar. Released less than a year before the system was discontinued, Captain Quasar is actually kinda decent. It's an isometric run-and-gun game that got some good reviews at the time, with GamePro calling it one of the best action games on the 3DO. A successor console to the 3DO was planned, called the M2, but it never made it to market. The 3DO was definitely a failure, but not as big a failure as this next system. Which is more advanced? Can you repeat the question? Jaguar! 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 When bits were all the rage, Atari's final home console went all in on the craze, using its do the math marketing campaign and a Jaguar cube that screamed at you every time you booted your console up. Atari's Jaguar was the first 64-bit console, except it didn't really have 64 bits per se. And besides Alien vs. Predator, Tempest, and maybe two or three other games, it was complete crap. Released in November 1993 with two less than good games, Cybermorph Where did you learn to and Trevor McFur in the Crescent Galaxy, the Jag didn't last long. In fact, you may have seen it in your dentist's office, since there were so many unsold units that the shell were sold off to be repurposed for this, uh, thing. Sure, next to the Genesis and the SNES, it looks a bit better sometimes, but side by side with a PS1 or a Saturn, it just couldn't compete. The system's final release was a port of Worms in 1998. However, its swan song was its final Atari-published game, Fight for Life, in January 96. Fight for Life was intended to be a direct competitor to Sega's Virtual Fighter series. I mean, it was even programmed solely by a former member of Sega's AM2 studio. But it fails in every regard. The graphics are pretty good for the Jag, but its poor controls and frame rate of like 3 FPS make for a horrendous experience. A fitting end to a troubled console that managed to sell less than 250,000 units throughout its existence. So how do you save a console that's dead on arrival and almost no one owns? Well, if you're a top mind at Atari, you release a CD add-on. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. The Jaguar CD came out after the system had been discontinued. With just 13 games officially released in total, I don't even know if the thing could technically have a swan song. But let's try. Its final game was Iron Soldier 2, which came out in December of 1997, about a year after Atari originally launched the Jaguar CD. It's a mech game that is a sequel to the first Jaguar cartridge-based game. It's supposedly quite good. Iron Soldier 2 is said to improve upon the original game in almost every way, but I don't think it's a reason to go out and get yourself a Jaguar CD. You know, I know the Jaguar CD is, like, terrible, but I've always kind of wanted one. I, I don't know, I have this weird obsession with bad consoles, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, that does it for this video. I had to split this one into two parts, because, frankly, I didn't really realize how big it was going to be until I started working on it, but that's okay. Part two will pick up with the Sega Dreamcast, and it will go all the way through until the PlayStation 4, Xbox One era, with some weird stuff peppered in there, too, like the Ouya. Ooh, 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 yeah? Yeah. I want to say thanks again to Tom for stopping by and covering the Super Nintendo. And of course, thank you for watching, and see you next time. Thanks.